Thank you. Well, uh, it's always exciting to be back here in the, at the university. I was thinking as I was parking in the parking garage, which by the way didn't exist when I was here as a student, um, and this building had, was just brand new, my, my second year in my MBA program, um, how much I really value what this university brings, not only to Southern Arizona, but to the entire state and the entire nation. Some of our most important work in the nation gets done right here. So congratulations on being part of a great university. Uh, as a, a free and open discussion point, I am from Kentucky. So I'm a University of Kentucky fan as well. So when we play basketball, I just don't watch. Right. So um, anyway, but it's a pleasure to be here and talk a little bit about um, a topic that I've become very um, passionate about, and that's about how we address diversity now as I look at my roles as I progress in my career and now am a part of a couple of corporate boards, publicly held company uh, public boards. So if we can go to the next slide. There's always the obligatory what I'm going to tell you, and then at the end I have to tell you what I told you uh, in the form of a quiz, I think, that we're going to go through and, and uh, go and, and discuss the answers. But what I'd like to ask from, from you all is that this is a discussion. Okay, so please stop me at any time. I mean, I can talk forever which I promise I won't because it's almost lunchtime, but I can talk forever about the subject of diversity. Um, what does it mean? How is it relevant? Is it relevant um, in, the, in corporate boardrooms? Um, but it, how do we define diversity? I think at the end of the day, uh, when you talk about social issues like diversity and you talk about uh, the impact to the business climate, um, sometimes there's no yes or no, right or wrong answer. Um, and so it just creates an, uh, a need for a more open dialogue when you talk about diversity. So um, I've got lots of pictures in here because I'm a picture person and I do believe a picture uh, says a thousand words. And so we'll talk about that. I'll throw up some pictures. Um, when I first, I have to tell you, when I first sent my slides to Gandhi, she says, uh, Linda, you need a little bit more content in your slides because I just had pictures. And so I appreciate her advice and there is more content in my slides. So again, we're going to talk about what was then? What was the climate in corporate boardrooms even as little as 10 years ago? And, and how is that climate changing and why is that relevant to you? Uh, certainly as um, business students, uh, MIS students if you are, um, as you go through your career, um, you have a focus and an interest in the business climate. Why is diversity a business issue? Why do, why do we even care about it? So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about uh, the dialogue that's going on um, from what I've seen, my lens as a member of a couple corporate boards. And then we'll just have a general diversity discussion. I mean, how do you define diversity in the corporate boardroom? And then we'll talk about a related issue, but it's sort of different. And that's corporate culture and boardroom culture. And does that matter as well? And of course, um, I have uh, some tips for you if someday you want to be up here talking as a board member uh, to, the, to the future of America, uh, such as you all are. So next slide. All right, so that was then. Um, I heard a very disparaging term that I don't really like. But at the time, now we're calling this pale, male, and stale. I don't know that I really like that <laughs> um, moniker for this, um, but let's just talk about this. We make an assumption based on this picture that this isn't diverse. We immediately say, okay, those are all um, white males. Immediately there's no diversity in this picture. Is that true? Nope. Is that true? Why, why is it not true? Presumably, right? Different age groups. Different age groups, right? Um, yeah, there is some different, I mean, if you look closely, there could be some different ethnicities in there. I didn't say that, right? But yeah, so, so I think, again, that, that starts to frame the discussion on diversity. But the fact is, is that um, until about, I would say, 10, 15 years ago, 
The way boardrooms were being created, um, and this is before Sarbanes-Oxley and some of the things that drove uh, different skill sets in the boardrooms, um, how, how corporate boards were created was by a series of, of networking. So you had a sitting CEO, and that CEO knew other CEOs or retired CEOs or retired CFOs. And using that individual's network, they would reach out and find people that they thought would bring value to their board. Um, today's environment is, I won't say it's necessarily more complex, but in some cases with government regulations and with the interconnectedness of cyber, um, it creates a requirement for different skill sets. And you have to reach out beyond your personal network now to look at the skills that you need in the boardroom. So, next slide. So this is sort of now. This is increasing board um, diversity. And there's a lot of talk about gender diversity in the boardroom. And there's a lot of talk about um, how many women do you need on a board for there to be gender diversity? Is that a hard number? Is, you know, is two enough? Is three too many? It sounds like a prune commercial. You guys are probably too young to know about that commercial, <laughs> but I know about that commercial. Um, but, but anyway, I mean, how, how many women on a board is enough? Depends on the size of the board. Maybe it depends on the industry of the board that they're on. Um, maybe it depends on the skill set that they bring. Maybe a diverse board is a majority of women. I don't know, but, but there's a lot of discussion going on around gender parity and, and what that means. Um, and so the National Association of Corporate Directors, if you all are interested in learning more about corporate boards, NACD is a great resource. Um, it does cost to join and it's pretty pricey, So, but they also have a lot of free information out on their website that you can look up. Um, and and they have a new initiative, I think it's called Next, that talks about the boardroom of, of the future and, and getting um, diversity into the boardroom, not just related to gender, but uh, backgrounds and um, and uh, people of color as well. Um, so, uh, but this is now. This is a constant dialogue that's going on in corporate boardrooms today. Next slide. All right. So, um, diversity is a business imperative, but why? I'd like to just throw that out. Why? Why should businesses even care whether they're diverse? In their in their boardroom, yes. Uh, because diversity brings in different thoughts into the show. Like men think differently, women think differently on an issue. Mm -hmm. Backgrounds have a role to play in that. Right, right. And you bring up a good point. Um, when we talk about diversity, there's a tendency to talk about equal equality. Yeah. Equal, <laughs> you know that word. Um, but at the same time, there needs to be a recognition that we do think different. And, and not just that men and women think different, people of color think different, um, different um, backgrounds think, bring differences in the boardroom. And so it's an important under, to understand that as well, I think. Um, and so there's also a discussion about do directors, when, when you sit on a board, a, a publicly held company board, your role is primarily to represent shareholders and protect shareholder value at the end of the day, As particularly if you're an independent board member, which means you're not a part of management of that company. You're not the CFO or the CEO. You're an independent board member. And you have a large responsibility to protect shareholder value and grow the company responsibly. That's really what you do. Yes, sir. Yeah, and that's an excellent point. I have a, a, a couple of slides in here or a, a bit later talking about um, corporate investors and in, what's called institutional investors are now mandating that they will uh, soon to be no longer invest in companies that don't have a diverse board yet they fail to define diverse, right? So, so we've got to help our institutional investors sitting now on the corporate board side. I have to help my institutional investors understand what I mean um, by the boards I'm on, 
what diversity means there. But, but there is a financial impact now if we don't bring in different skill sets and bring in more diversity into the boardroom. Um, but on the director responsibilities, it's not commonly known, but as a director, you really are responsible for the culture of that company. Sure, it starts with management, and we'll get into a more detailed discussion about culture of company, but you have a responsibility to do what's called here, driving board composition and board vitality. So board composition, you have a, um, a governance committee, uh, typically on a board, and you have a nom and compensation committee on your board of directors. Your nomination committee is usually made up of independent directors and one of their sole duties is to look around and find board members. And, and so their job has gotten a little bit harder. It's in some cases a little bit easier now because there's a bigger crop to pick from. But this is where the problem comes in. Wonder if you're looking for a certain skill set. Take cyber because I like that topic because that's my background. You're looking for a cyber skill set and someone has, that has not just an IT background, but potentially a cyber background. And you're looking around, and your network um, doesn't have any cyber professionals on it. Um, or, wonder if you find the right candidate, but that candidate is a white male. But you have a mandate from your institutional investors to bring in diversity into your board. What are you going to do? You also have a responsibility to protect shareholder value. And you consider cyber a big risk. I would say you have a great opportunity. You can go hire that individual, and well, it's not really hiring, it's bringing them into the board, and they will stand for election, and then the shareholders will vote. And that person could come in, and that person could probably add great value to that board. Or you have an opportunity to expand your horizon and see what's out there. Look past the CEOs and the CFOs that are part of your network. Kind of look out there for people with different backgrounds. I'm a retired military officer um, whose last assignment was at United States Cyber Command. I know a little bit about cyber, right? And so um, I had to let it be known that I was available. Um, I didn't, wasn't contacted through a search committee or anything like that, but I w went to a forum called the Battlefield to Boardroom that NACD runs that takes uh, respiring general officers and flag officers and runs them through a one-week course about what does it really mean to be a board member. It sounds really cool. The fact is, do you really want to take this risk on and be a member of a board where you have huge responsibility? And if that answer is yes, then NACD will work with you. But I, and so I received my opportunity for my first board through NACD. But it came about because they asked me to come speak. After the Battlefield to Boardroom course that I went through, they heard about my background in cyber, so NACD asked me to come back and speak to them about why cyber is a topic of importance in the boardroom, why it's not just a management issue, but it should be elevated at the board level. An individual there heard me speak. 18 months later, that individual called me. 18 months. Your life goes on, you know. Um, she called me and she said, hey, I, are you interested? I initially was going to say no, right? And then, but you should, so here's another lesson. Um, and now that I'm wizened and old, I can share all of my lessons with you. Um, one of them is never immediately say no to opportunities that, that you're not sure about, right? Um, always listen. I've, I find great value in listening. And, and hearing people out and then making a decision. And so the more I talked to this individual, the more I thought, well, this would be really cool. Let me, let me see if I want to take this on. And, and lo and behold, um, it, it, that took, my vetting for that one board took 18 months. And from that board, I was offered another board. Um, and that vetting only took three months. And so, because I, it just so happened that I had the right skill set for that for that second board. And so she had a responsibility. That person who contacted me, she wasn't really on the nominating and governance committee, but she was a member of a global board 
and she viewed it her responsibility to keep her board um, engaged and vital and relevant in today's issues and she knew my background not only my cyber background but uh, they were very attracted to my military background as well um, and so directors do have a responsibility far beyond just uh, I, and I shouldn't say just, because it's a big responsibility to uh, represent the shareholders and the fiduciary responsibility that you have. So next slide. All right, so I'd like to spend a little bit of time on this slide because we have a tendency um, to think that um, political correctness does away with all of your biases. If you can be politically correct, you have no bias and, and you just see, you just basically see people for what they are and, and you don't have any bias that goes in there. Is that true? Does political correctness do away with bias? No. Just means you don't say things, right? Define political correctness. Yeah, I don't know. That's a hard one to define. I would throw that back at you. How would you define political correctness? I think that's what I asked. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think it's not saying things that are inappropriate. So, I mean, you don't, there's certain terms you don't use anymore that probably you could use maybe 10 years ago. I think it's um, trying to be, I view in some cases political correctness, just pe treating people with dignity, okay. right? Um, but that doesn't mean, mean I've done away with my total, my bias. I have bias, I was brought in, in Kentucky probably means that you're expecting me to be barefoot and in shorts, right? So, um, and, and talk with a really thick southern accent. Um, but, so, so we all have biases. So let's talk a little bit about what types of biases we may have that would influence the way we think about things. Yeah. Well, being politically correct seems like you're just covering your conscious bias, but your unconscious bias is still there, so. Yeah. And I think you bring up a good point. Um, emotional intelligence, to me, just means you know you have unconscious bias. You know that when you walk into a room, you have an unconscious bias that you're immediately going to make um, some assumptions about the audience or the people that you're talking to. And if you can emotionally have enough emotional intellect to understand that, then you'll be able to move on. It doesn't mean you can ever, in my opinion, uh, this Linda Medler opinion, I'm not sure you can ever do away with some internal bias. You're a product of your upbringing. You're a product of your religious background. You're a product of your family background. You're a product of your work environment. All of those things influence you as you grow up. Um, and they imprint on your brain. But as you grow older, again, I can say, because I'm older, as you grow older, you widen your lens, I think, and you have a better understanding and acceptance of differing of opinions. Um, you know, so let's talk about bias. Everybody that watches Fox News is this. Everybody that watches CNN is this. All women multitask well, were organized, P pick something. Well, I have the sloppiest desk in the office, okay? So I may be organized only in that I know where everything is on that sloppy desk, right? So, so we all have biases and, and what, um, what drives that. So I'm just going to throw a few out there. Men are. Men are. When you think about men in a boardroom, or if you just say general, like, like the terms I use for women, organized, multitask, you said men, men like sports. That's a bias. Not all men like sports. Most do, but not all, right? Um, men are aggressive. All men are aggressive, they're all type A. Not really, I mean, I know some really nice, easy to get along with men, right? So, so that's an example of a bias. How about Asians? Are all Asians alike? Asians are good at, math. good at math. There you have it. Hard working, the best students. I mean, pick it, right? That's a bias. Um, African Americans are all from the South. Good at sports. They're tall. They're tall. 
I mean, uh, pick it. So, so I'm just trying to point out some typical biases that we have. Um, atheists are. There you have it. <laughs> yeah, we could have a long discussion on that, couldn't we? <laughs> right, right. No, I think I, it's that's great. Um, transgenders are weird. Weird, yeah. Transgenders are wanting to be somebody else. I don't know. But, but, I, don't, I don't mean that. I just that's. No, but no. So I, I don't. So throw those out. It doesn't mean that I think you, you know, are. I'm just trying to get you to think about what typical biases are. Um, military officers are organized. <laughs> Super type A. Don't collaborate well. Get it done. Mission oriented. Yeah, but I'm a pretty good collaborator. I didn't make general officer because I ticked a bunch of people off. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, you do have to get your job done. You have to get it done in the right way, right? So, so again, I just wanted to point out that we have to, as we grow in our uh, lives and our careers, to be um, have enough, enough emotional intelligence to recognize that we have bias and to what that bias brings. It could bring some positive things into the boardroom. Um, you could recognize that you have a bias when you're starting to talk about your customers and your consumers. And you're, let's say if you're, if you're in the, um, like Target or Walmart, do you have assumptions about your customers that may be formed by biases? that is limiting, and I'm not saying Target or Walmart do this, I'm just giving an example, that could be limiting how you do your marketing and your outreach, could be. So you need to recognize that in, in my mind. Um, so I guess I would ask the next question, does bias matter? Do you think it matters? It does. Yeah, I think it matters too. I think we'll always have it again because I think you're a product of your upbringing. Um, but it can be helpful, as I pointed out, I think, with the, with the uh, Walmart Target example. Um, next slide. All right, diversity. Goodness gracious. How do you define it? Is it all based on um, ethnic background, gender? No. If you have if you have a board that's again back in that first picture that is all men, it can still be very diverse, right? I think it can. Um, probably not as diverse as it should be, should be, but it can still be very diverse. Um, and so I think it's important as we look at corporate boardrooms and the skill sets that they're bringing. When you define diversity, it really is about looking beyond the color of someone's skin or their gender or perhaps even their sexual orientation and looking at their background and their skill set to really define diversity. So I'm going to give you a um, kind of a, a test scenario here. So next slide. All right, an example. As, uh, as Gandhi mentioned, um, I'm very proud to be associated with Raytheon Missile Systems and the company Raytheon, a very, a very innovative company, a large defense contractor. Um, and you would think because of who we are, we would be ultra conservative. And as a company, we probably are. But I, I really believe Raytheon is helping to lead the charge across, um, really across industry on what they mean by diversity, not only within the company, but also in their boardroom. So we recently, not we, I'm not on the Raytheon board, but the board recently um, voted to bring on Adrienne Brown and she was elected to the Raytheon Board of Directors. So let's just start with this picture. Okay. So immediately, what do you think about bringing her on the Raytheon Board of Directors? Next slide. Okay, so a picture. She's obviously female, and she's African American. So you can check the diversity block, right? 
Really? Is that why we brought her on? I don't know. Next slide. Look at this background she has. Quite incredible, actually. And then if you look at, she's on the board of eBay. Why would a large defense contractor be interested with somebody that's on the board of eBay? Or why would eBay be interested with somebody with her technical background at Corning, for example? Lots of reasons, I think. The other thing that's uh, illustrative here is what nonprofit she ha she's on. So if you were to um, look up my bio and just, you know, if you're bored one night, and, um, and you looked at what nonprofits I on, I'm on, the boards, it would tell you a lot about who I am, right? What my passions are, what I care about. Um, that I'm on Paulo's board um, for the Eller School. I'm on the board of Operation Homefront. Um, it's a veteran organization that helps our active duty and our veteran uh, military members and their families. Um, I have four kids. I have eight grandkids. So I'm very family oriented. So Operation Homefront focuses on families. Um, so when you look at the, bo uh, the nonprofit boards that um, Ms. Brown is on, Jobs for American Graduates, that particular nonprofit has an interesting focus and that's about how to make sure that um, we get uh, disadvantaged youth through college and we make sure that they have jobs when they get out. So pretty, pretty strong background. Um, so next slide. So then um, Tom Kennedy is the Raytheon Chairman and CEO. And when you look at what the announcement that was made of, of Ms. Brown and when she was brought on the board of directors, nowhere here do you see that he said, we needed diversity in the boardroom, so we brought her on, right? But the fact is, is it helps that she is a person who has a diverse background. But let me tell you a little bit more about her. Um, and you can, you can look her up. She just has an incredible background. When she was eight years old, um, we were still in a segregated environment. And so that may, um, and, and as an African American, she went to an all black school as an eight year old. Her, ter her parents were teachers and they taught in the all black school. And when she was eight years old, desegregation came in and um, she was in the pool to be bused over to a, a white school. And she tells a story of how she just, at eight years old, she cried. Because she, she couldn't picture her life any different than what it was. And that was going to the high school where her children, or where her parents taught, and coming up in that, in that school. And, um, but her parents, um, being wise, uh, very wise, said, no, you need to go over there and you need to start making a difference. And so she did. She was one of only two African Americans in the school at the time. Um, I'm a product of that time, so I can tell you it was very challenging. I was actually bused as a white person to go over and integrate a largely uh, black school. And so, um, so it, it was just a very interesting time. But she has a great quote, and I'd like to throw it up here. Next slide. Um, when she was eight years old, when she encountered that, that was traumatic for her. She was very young. By the time she was in the sixth grade, she was elect, elected class president, and she had been a mentor to, to uh, additional African-American um, children who came into the school. And that formed her. So if you read her quote, it's a little hard to read, but I'll, I'll uh, read it to you. The impact of being eight years old and stepping into a difficult position molded me. It showed me that discomfort breeds growth, and I followed that tenant ever since. I think that's why Raytheon brought her on. Obviously, depth and wealth of background, extensive uh, experience as a CEO and technology leader, interested in education as based on her nonprofit boards but then look at her what she also brings is the ability to overcome difficulty and and look at things look at the big picture and come up with solutions to hard problems so next slide 
So you, we had a little discussion about institutional investors and why they're um, getting more active. Uh, a couple of big institutional investors, um, the New York State Common Retirement Fund, that doesn't sound like that big of an institutional investor, but look, they hold shares in 400 public companies that have no women on their boards and 700 companies that have just woman, one woman director. And they have just said that they will no longer invest in companies that don't have at least one woman director. And if they only have one woman, that they will uh, not uh, vote to, to keep the people uh, who are on the governance committee. Interesting, interesting. Um, BlackRock is, uh, is also a big institutional investor, and they just issued a public letter emphasizing diversity in the boardroom and said that they will exercise their proxy votes. Proxy votes, if you're shareholders, is what you vote. Um, and one of the most powerful things shareholders has is the ability to vote for the board of directors. Um, so interesting. And then NACD has kicked off a multi-year initiative to look at diversity in the boardroom um, and inclusion. So um, let's go to the next slide, and we're almost going to wrap it up here so we can, um, we can move on to the quiz, of course, uh, and get you out of here on time. All right, so we've already talked about all of this. Um, the one thing I would like to bring up is um, wealth diversity. So when you look at corporate boardrooms, I can tell you the two boards I'm on, I significantly lower the average wealth of the people in those board, in that board uh, by, by a significant margin. But what does that mean I bring? A down-to-earthness? I don't have a driver take me everywhere? I don't have a private jet? You know, not that they all do, but, but, but when we talk about wealth and we talk about protecting our customers, and one is a financial institution, I can relate. I can relate to maybe having difficulty qualifying for a mortgage at one time, or you know, needing a home equity loan, or a car loan. Thank goodness I can't you know, talk about having my car repossessed or my house foreclosed on, but I bring a general sense of the average uh, working class, if you will, to the boardroom. That's of great value, I think. And I think we're seeing more and more of that in the boardroom. Um, so next slide. We'll wrap up with this, and then I'll give you some tips about if you're interested in, in charting a course to being on a corporate board someday. Um, and then we'll get into the quiz. So um, how many of you all had, have read about the craziness that went on with Uber and Wells Fargo? Any of you? It's just, it's, it's just crazy. I'll just leave it at that, but I want to I want to read you something, and I knew I wouldn't remember this statistic, so I, I marked it here. Um, why is it crazy? Why why is culture important? I mean, it's not just because we think we have to have a good culture and people treat with people with dignity. We wish that was just the reason why, but there's bigger reasons and there's business reasons. So listen to this. According to a study, total shareholder return at Wells Fargo would have been $89 billion to $121 billion higher had it not gone through its scandals, directly impacting shareholder wealth, directly impacting shareholder wealth. Uber's valuation is now $22 billion lower than it was before the company's cultural problems came to light last year. It's a lot of money a lot of money, a lot of impact. And the common findings for those two organizations, they couldn't, the two organizations couldn't be very diff more different, right? One drives people around and one's a bank. But what they found was that um, not only the CEO and the, the C-suite was insulated, but the board was insulated. They weren't asking the right questions of management. They were, they were on a culture of driving fast returns and fast growth at the expense of standards and ethics. And it's a board responsibility to make sure that your C-suite is operating appropriately in accordance with your ethics. So as a board member, you're really oversight. You're not management. Management is what um, management does, the C-suite and below, right? 
But you do have a responsibility to ask hard questions. What's your turnover rate? What's your whistle whistleblower re uh, policy? How many ethics complaints did we have last year? Do we have a couple of really good performers that always make their numbers? Maybe they're being incentivized the wrong way. To me, those are important questions in a boardroom test. So next slide. All right. Um, I think you all will have these slides. I don't want to go into detail because we only have 10 minutes left for the quiz. But um, if you aspire to be a board member, it starts today. Um, when I sat where you all are sitting, I never thought um, I would be a member of a board, really. Um, I knew I liked business, but I was actually still wearing my uniform when I was a student here. I was very blessed that the Air Force sent me to get my MBA. Um, so the joke was I was the best paid MBA in the class because I at least had a job. So, um, but anyway, um, but you know, you, it's not too early to kind of think about this as a path for you. Um, and, and, and what I would say is not all boards are, f are a good fit for you. When I was first retiring from the Air Force, I had an opportunity. It was a, a smaller defense contracting company. Um, and I interviewed to be on their board. And I probably would have accepted that board if they would have offered it to me. <laughs> I'm glad. You know, it's funny how things turn out. They did not. And it would have been a horrible fit. I didn't connect with the CEO when we were talking. The board, when I went in for my interview, it was like um, the Spanish Inquisition, right? And they were all lined up on this side. I had a glass of water and I felt like I was on trial. I mean, that culture does not fit me. Um, some boards are very type A personality where it's really about one upsmanship in the boardroom. That is kind of going away, but that culture doesn't fit me and I would not do well in that environment. So I think it's important to understand who you are as a person and look at the companies or the board environment that you want to be part of. Um, and so that goes to the last thing. What kind of culture are you suited for? Where do you want to lead? Okay, I'm happy to take, yes, over here. What, something I'm having a hard time defining is in my club, the different student organizations I'm a part of is um, measuring the success of different diversity initiatives and different things I'm doing. Um, it's very hard to measure quantitatively, but are there like qualitative things that you can look for like to kind of signal, oh, you know, we're doing well? You know, that's a great question. Um, I've done a lot of reading, obviously, on board diversity, and there's a general question that says, what makes a board diverse? You know, um, and so I think it's important some, to me, some qualitative measures you can look for is to see if you have group think in your organizations, right? So is everybody agreeing to the same thing around the table or do you have engagement and dialogue around issues? Um, is there collaboration, but is there disagreement? Disagreement is not bad. I don't think disagreement is ever bad. Um, there's a way to do it respectfully and, and, uh, and question uh, a path an organization is going on. But I think those are some qualitative things that you can look at. Um, quantitatively, I don't, that's even harder. All of these organizations that are doing these think tanks that are trying to do these studies on, you know, females on the boards grew by 5%, that's not enough. Well, what is enough? Should it have been 25%? Should it have been 90%? I don't know. How do you define that? Um, so they're all grappling with how do you measure that. At the end of the day, I think it's, it goes back to those um, qualitative measures that say, OK, are you having good, fruitful, hard-hitting conversations in your organization? And if you are, your board is diverse. I hope that makes sense. Yes, ma'am. What does it mean to be a board member? Oh, yeah, so, so there's all different kinds of board members. So I'm a member of Paulo's board. That's an advisory board. I have no power to tell Paulo what to do. Thank goodness. Um, but the board of advisors is there to help him chart the course for the university, for the um, Eller School, right? So that's a board of advisors. Um, I'm on a nonprofit board. Uh, Operation Homefront, as I mentioned, and that board helps. I'm largely a fundraiser. I believe in the mission, and I go out and I try and find people who also believe in that mission, and that's my board responsibility. Then for my corporate boards, that's totally different. 
that's a paid position and I have a responsibility to go in, look at all the board material, look at the financials, look at um, our risk profile, and balance that against what I think is best for the shareholders. And so that really elevates the discussion about the things, the emotional intelligence you need, and the understanding about what is risky. It's, for some boards, it can be very weighty issues like, on their risk matrix, they could have things, for example, a major economic turn down plus nuclear war. I mean, when you're talking about board issues, you know, how do you chart on your risk matrix nuclear war? But is it something you need to be thinking about? Yeah, maybe. So, so that's what it means to be a board, is to kind of look at those social issues, look at those big issues, and then define how you would invest in uh, your, pro, your capital and your profile to make sure that your company stays viable. Because you have shareholders that have invested in you. So, yes ma'am, over here. Well, and just to add to that, um, so I serve on a board, and it's a nonprofit, but mm -hmm. and we are not paid, but it's a, for a financial institution, and we oversee the CEO. So we would be in charge of hiring, firing, yeah. um, compensation for our, our yeah. CEO. Yeah. Um, so it's major, you know, it's things like um, succession planning. So you want the vitali vitality of your organization to still go on. So you need to do succession planning. You need to do board succession planning, compensation, risk and governance. It's a pretty broad responsibility. So next slide. Let's see. How about here? Yes. Uh, can you expand on having the right mindset to serve as a board director? <sighs> What do I mean by that? I mean um, the ability to think strategically and not tactically. Um, do you have the life experiences that allow you to now step back and have those conversations? It, there is a fine line between running a company and overseeing a company. And can you make that jump? It's, it's similar but much different. I'll just point this out. So, um, I started off my military career as an enlisted Marine, okay, um, and then there are some people who start off in the enlisted part of the services that want to be officers, but, and they wind up getting a commission, but they can never make that jump to what it means to be an officer versus enlisted. Um, that is a comparison about how do you, even at the senior level, you're a CEO of a company, you're pretty senior. That doesn't mean you'll be a good board member. Maybe you'll try to really, as a board member, run that company. You're not supposed to run the company. You're supposed to oversee the company and help management make the right decisions and call them on it if you don't think that they are. So, all right, back here. What is the first step you think an organization should take to incorporate uh, diversity, especially when in a company where there's never been an initiative to do so? Something that I think you have to hold, you know what, um, I've read a lot about that. How, how, do you, how do you get diversity going when it hasn't even gotten off the starting gate, right? Um, a couple of the things I've read, some suggestions have been to hold the CEO accountable because it has to start in the company. Look around and see the C-suite. Is there diversity in the C-suite? Um, because it's a network, right? Um, I, you know, there's just um, a lot of intangibles. You have to expand what you're looking for in the boardroom or in your organization. If you're always looking for retired CEOs to be on your board, that's all you're going to get. So you have to expand it and, and look at other skill sets. I've never been a CEO. I've never been a CFO. Um, but I ran large institutions in the Air Force. I was responsible for a base of 24,000 people and a multi-million dollar budget. So, you know, while I wasn't a CFO, I do have some financial acumen and I have a great MBA. So, um, <laughs> you know, so that, that helps. So, other questions? Let's see, how about here? In the beginning of the presentation, we heard that there are a few risks that are associated with being a board member. Could you tell us some of these potential risks? Well, um, you're held accountable, okay? So you have fiduciary responsibility and you can be sued by the shareholders if, if they think in their view you did not do your duty. It's called the duty of care. 
if you do not do the duty of care as a board member. And so you just have to be able to say, I'm comfortable enough with this company and the direction of the company, and I'm comfortable enough with what my skill set is that I'm willing to take that, those risks to go in and be a board member because I believe in driving um, this business forward. Um, so those are some risks. You can get fired. I mean, one of my boards, one of my boards, it's a four-year term. Um, my other board, the board members are elected every year. And so, and, and that's a shareholder right, and they can, you know, kick us out if they don't like what we're doing. So I think those are the primary risks. Um, most corporate boards will give you what's called director and officer life, uh, not life, director and officer insurance, liability insurance, so you carry some of that. Um, so you can't necessarily be sued and lose your house. But I mean, it can be pretty risky, especially in periods of economic downturn. Um, let's say it's a it's a bank or whatever, and and you lose you know shareholder wealth or people you know wind up going bankrupt. I mean you could you could be at major risk if you haven't run the company in the way, or not run but overseen the company in the way that shareholders are expecting. So, okay, a couple more. Yes. How do you um, assess your biases, recognize the unhealthy ones, and even hopefully get rid of them? And I mean unconscious biases. Yeah. Um, boy, that's an excellent question. There's a bunch of courses you can actually take on emotional intelligence. There's some stuff out there you can read on it that talks about how you, um, you're able to look at your bias and recognize what they are. Um, and to me, it does go with that, that fluffy idea of emotional intelligence and knowing what that is. Um, but the first thing I think you can do is just look at yourself and look at how you react when you walk in a room of people that don't look like you. Okay. What do you think when you do that? Wow. You know, and then stop for a minute and say, oh, that's probably not, I thought X, Y, or Z about this person and maybe I shouldn't have. So I think we're out of time. Can you be one last question? One last question. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> You've been on multiple boards. How country diverse are your boards? Because growing up in a different environment in the U.S. is very different to growing up in an environment in China and India. Yeah. The U.S. no longer is the center of the world in money wise. Right. Mm -hmm. So how how diverse are your boards, and are we moving towards that direction? You know, yeah, excellent point. So my first board that I was vetted was a global board, and it was a a major um, global insurer, and um, because. I was a new board, I would have been a new board member that, that while I had global presence based on my 30 years of military experience, I didn't have global business acumen. Um, they dis we decided a better fit would to be on the U.S. board and that I hope, I hope someday maybe I would be considered to be on the global board. But I even think about that about U.S. companies because I looked at that model um, for that insurance company and they had board members from several different countries. And, um, and so I look at that now, and so whenever I look at a global company, I look to see where their board members come from. Do they all, you know, you can say you wanna be a global company and you can have all your board members from the United States. Well, are you really a global company if that's the case? You know, so um, the two boards I'm on are not that diverse. They're both in, the, I guess I would call the financial sector. Um, I hope someday I'll be, have an opportunity to be on a, perhaps an energy board or an airline board with my cyber background. Those are two areas I'm, I'd like to bring some value to. Um, but um, so, so it, it just depends. But I think your point is well taken about diversity in the boardroom needs to be uh, nationality as well, I think. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.